Good morning, aloha, welcome to the early intervention from surviving to thriving workshop. My name is Pat and this is Brian and we will be your wilderness explorer guys for this presentation. So just a little bit of reminder, um, SPIN's golden rules um, for the Zoom conference, similar to previous workshop you, um, if you attended, the workshop will be in the webinar format. Your video and sound will be turned off. To ask questions, please use Q&A um, button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, be kind, be considerate, be respectful. All workshops will be recorded and posted to the SPIN conference website soon. Please help us filling out a workshop evaluation using the link to provide to you workshop chat. Um, to turn on the um, Zoom captions on the bottom of your screen, uh, look for the CC live transcript button. Click on the up arrow to open a new window. Click on show subtitle and the captions will be on the screen. You can turn off the subtitles by hiding them. And um, before you go at the end of the workshop, please fill out a short evaluations for this workshop and the link will be posted um, in the Q&A box. And please welcome and meet our expert guy, Sherry Umakoshi, um, personnel development coordinator from the early interventions. Please take it away, Cherry. Good morning, everyone. And welcome to the third session of workshops today. Um, uh, thank you for that introduction, um, Dr. Chen, as well, and thank you for joining us. The workshop that you're joining today is the Surviving to Thriving, uh, Making the Most of Your Early Intervention Services. So what, we'd like, what I'd like to present to you is um, how early intervention and the approach and the um, interaction styles that we are implementing in our programs really help families and caregivers move from that survival mode to that thriving and that confidence building. I want to share with you the mission of early intervention, and this mission is part of our Part C, and when I say Part C, is it is we are part of the federal law, the IDEA, and there's a portion of that called Part C, which is the birth to three um, portion of the law. And in early intervention, our mission really is to support families and caregivers in meeting the needs of their child. So early intervention service are really designed around your child and family's needs and looking at those concerns and priorities and addressing those within your natural environments. And I'll explain in a little bit what natural environments are, but in working in those settings, we really want to ensure and maximize the learning opportunities that we know kids have throughout their day. So not only in the time that you have with your providers, but also providing you those strategies and supports that can sustain you between visits or between that time, because we know that in those other hours is where that real hard work goes in and where caregivers and parents um, really start to develop your skills, your confidence, and implement some of the great things that you learn from your early intervention um, staff. When we talk about natural environment, environments in early intervention, it's really looking at those settings that you and your child would spend the most time, whether or not he or she has a disability. What we know about children and at this young age is learning occurs everywhere, right? Not only in the time that you have with your individual um, speech pathologist or your OT or PT, but it's in that time that from the time they wake up to the time they go to bed at night and all the different activities or routines or outings that you have together. So these are those opportunities that really help 
um, in that implementation of the strategies to see where things and supports are needed and how we can really help caregivers and parents build those skills and build your confidence to address those challenging times that you have in whether it's language development, self-help skills, motor skills, is looking at those times, those challenging times and supporting you through that process when those routines occur. Um, these in natural settings or natural activities are typically things that are either high interest for your child, or it could be things that as a parent or caregiver in your routines, you need to get done, right? Whether it's meal preparation, taking your child to daycare, to preschool, to grandparents' house, um, getting ready for bed or waking in the morning. Those are those typical routines and activities that are quote unquote natural because it's part of your everyday routine. And we know that natural settings for every family and every child differs. So what our programs try to do and our providers try to do is really gear services around those times in the day that you may have challenges and how can we walk through those times with you to see what's happening, to provide some support, try out some activities together to see what really um, will fit with your needs. Um, some of the other activities that could be part of that natural sitting are those high child interest activities. So if you look at what your child typically likes to do during the day, it could be things like outdoor play, coloring, maybe um, playing with certain types of toys, doing songs together. So it really looks at what are those opportunities that we can build upon for learning and engaging. The approach that your early intervention team is using when they provide services is called the primary service provider or PSP approach. And what this means is this is that framework that we use for teaming, not only in um, the one-on-one -on -one services that that provider has with a family, but also in the teaming that they do together at the program with the other um, providers, professionals, and experts that we have access to. So this team of providers um, really works together to support your family. And what happens is once your child is identified um, with an IFSP in our program, one of those team members is selected as your primary service. So that's your primary contact and that person you really get to develop a rapport with and support through. That PSP also is connected with the larger team of providers that he or she can access at any point in time. So there's different ways that we can pull in the team when there's a need. The, it can be through short meetings where a question or support can be presented and feedback can be given. It could look in the form of a joint visit together where that secondary um, provider comes in to jointly work together on a question or a um, challenge that may have come up that your family really needs support around for your child. And it could even mean that um, you have larger team meetings where you bring more people to the table so that collectively everyone can be a part of that conversation, can um, give ideas together to problem solve and come up with um, as, as you and you as the parent look at what types of ideas they are, where are those, are those appropriate or do those fit with my needs and really get input from you as the caregiver into those strategies and supports. Because as a parent or caregiver, you are the expert on your child. You know what your child likes, dislikes, what you've tried, what has been successful or not. And that's really important for the team to know in order to um, guide you through that next step. So if we talk about that guide, guiding or going through that journey, it is a journey through early intervention. It's that discovery of where you're at and how do we get those, make those steps forward together. And part of that is learning from each other, right? How, how you have approached it before, what are some things you may have tried and we can start building upon those opportunities together. We have started implementing this approach also 
um, in the world of telepractice because of COVID. So we really have started blending this model to not only in-person um, home visits, but also via telepractice or through Zoom visits as well. Um, because of the um, safety pieces. And we've continued that even as um, the COVID situation has changed. So we're kind of ebbing and flowing through that process as well. And we've really seen how telepractice and Zoom has con continued to open that opportunity and give that variety of types of services that um, families are needing and wanting. The benefits of the PSP approach is that it really enables you as parents and caregivers to establish and maintain that really ongoing re working relationship with that team or that lead team member or your PSP. So we talk about um, building relationships, and this is a huge part, right? Relationships and trust take time to form. And it's establishing that person on your team that really gets to know the ins and outs, right? That you can really confide in and feel comfortable doing that. Um, it is a very vulnerable piece, right? Because as a parent myself, you're opening yourself to your vulnerabilities, the things that you struggle with. And it's really important to have that positive working relationship with your team member um, that you feel comfortable. The approach also promotes that positive child and family outcomes, right? So ultimately what we want to do over time in working with you is to build your capacity or build your sense of confidence as a parent that with our help and support that you have the abilities to help your child learn and grow, right? So it is that joint um, conversation, it's that joint effort together to see and go through those um, trials and errors to see what works and how we can change and add to your um, skills, skill areas. Um, what we also like about this approach is that it minimizes the negative consequences of having multiple or maybe um, rapidly changing providers. So in our, in our services previously, um, what we and what we've moved away from is having um, multiple multiple providers servicing the child either all at once or where you see multiple kids, multiple um, providers over a period of time, right? A lot of that comes with a lot of that comes is a lot of repetition or having to explain yourself multiple times to um, new providers all the time and then trying to figure out, how do I do what provider A, B, and C told me all at once? And that sense of sometimes overwhelmingness of which should I prioritize? Do I do that one idea first versus the other? So it's really trying to minimize that repetition or that frustration and um, making it a lot smoother or um, cleaner in a sense, that you have that one person that you connect with all the time who is like your guide, along with your care coordinator that helps you through that process, that connects you through that team. Here and there, you may have that need to, yes, bring in those secondary providers to help you through um, different challenges along the way. But we really try to urge and try to promote that lead primary service provider um, for each family. There are times though that that PSP may need to change because they may be leaving their position at a program or maybe on leave for an extended period of time, or sometimes it's just not a great fit, right? So then there are times where there could be a change in your primary service provider. In this PSP approach, the structure or the style of interaction that we use is called coaching. So coaching is really our strategy that we use um, as providers to help build the capacity of caregivers. And when I mean capacity, it's building of skills, building of knowledge, building your comfort level and your confidence as a parent to support your child's learning. And it could also be to identify and obtain desired resources and supports. So it 
is that child focus in terms of building their development and how you address those needs, but also as a family, are there resources or are there supports that you need as a parent or as a family unit um, to move you forward? And some of those things could be things like housing, it could be thinking through um, my routine for the day so I can spend more time with my child, it could be things like finding childcare or financial um, assistance so my child can go to preschool or, in, or socialize with other kids. So that's a big part of um, our early intervention services as well. What the coaching does is it enables us to really utilize that reflective process and that open communication so that we can really learn more about um, what's happening, um, ideas that you've tried, and that so that we can problem solve new ideas together. And if you see that word coaching, it's a very commonly um, used word. And similar to other situations, coaching is about, right, you have that time with your primary service provider or your expert or your coach, right, who has ideas, and you practice those, and you um, hone your skills in while you're there in your session. And what then happens is after that one-on-one -on -one time, it's that ongoing practice throughout the day or throughout the week or throughout the month that really helps to build that child's skills or your your capacity as a parent to implement those strategies. So similar to like learning a sport or um, learning a new skill, right? It's not only the practice that you have during that game or that we're during that time with your teammates, but it's all the practice in between that happens. So it's culminating and it's very similar to how we think of coaching broadly is we've pulled that same type of interaction and practice into early intervention and how our providers and uh, work with you as parents and caregivers. So knowing that, what does early intervention services look like when we use this PSP approach as well as the coaching? And these are some examples for you to take a look at and I'll describe some of them for you. Is on the left-hand side, is what um, services look like using this PSP approach. And on the right-hand side is what we wanna move away from. So if you look at the first example on the top is what we really wanna do is have the child interacting with you as the parent or caregiver with that provider observing on the side for a little bit, right? Seeing what's actually happening in that time where you really need support. So they can get an idea of typically what may happen, some of the challenges that you may have voiced to your provider so that you can together reflect and um, come up with new ideas on what to try to address and build um, your child's skills as well as you as a parent. What we wanna move away from is having the child playing and practicing with the provider while the caregiver is on the side watching. So it's really pulling you in as a parent to be engaged and part of that whole interaction. Because ultimately what you wanna do is we want you to feel comfortable in implementing the strategies that we come up with together, right? And making sure that that's appropriate for you. And if there's any difficulty, if something's not matching, those are opportunities for you and the provider to work together to say, you know, I think that strategy is a little bit too hard or it doesn't match with what I was thinking. Can we try something else? And let's give it a whirl. While we're here together with Johnny, right? Can we try it and see how it goes and, and tweak it along the way before I leave? Okay. The second um, example talks about as a parent caregiver, you discuss and identify times within those daily routines and activities when you need support, right? Thinking about, for instance, for myself as a parent um, of young kids is um, when I was teaching my child, my kids to um, feed themselves, right? And I had a hard time figuring out how do they hold it? How do they scoop it? It's not quite working. Is thinking about, yeah, it would be really helpful if my provider could come during that snack time or during that breakfast or lunch time where I struggle the most. And 
basing those therapy times around those activities where you can work together with someone to problem solve, to try something new and practice it um, during those routines. Will it happen um, all the time? And will that schedule happen um, smoothly all the time? Probably not. But it's thinking about when are those times where I really need support as a parent that I would really love to have my coach there or my early intervention provider there with me, right? Is it when I'm trying to transition and get my child into the car seat in the afternoon because he may not want to go home yet and I'm struggling to take him in and put him in his car seat and he's screaming and I would really love some strategies on what to do when I'm in the moment. So those are some times to think about in those natural routines and activities of could that be an opportunity where your provider could meet with you, right? And see what happens and problem solve together to make that, um, that time easier and run smoother. Okay. Um, what we want to avoid on the right-hand side for that example is scheduling visits just based on availability. For instance, hey, you know what? Nine o'clock works great because that's a good time for me. Johnny's behaving really well and I don't have to work and, you know, I can talk freely together, right? Is really looking at, is it just based on what time works best for us or how do we start linking that time of, I want to address my needs for my child. When are those moments that I can really include um, so I can get that feedback uh, firsthand as it's happening? Um, in that activity together. So it does take a little bit more um, thinking through and planning and really visualizing what um, you as a parent would like to get out of that time together as a provider who has that knowledge and expertise using some of um, questions and feedback to plan that out well together or to work through um, some ideas to see if it really does meet your needs. Okay, the third um, example is talking about brainstorming with parents and giver, caregivers to identify more places or sometimes partners or routines where the child could practice successful skills. So sometimes we have mastered, say, um, language development together at home, right? Because that was a, a challenge. But now that that's successful, we want to start look at how do we build that language development to other routines or other um, environments where maybe we're struggling, right? Because my child is really comfortable with me at home, maybe language is great. But now that we go to auntie's house and they're not as familiar, maybe how do we work on language there, right? So to build language in other environments or other routines that are important for us as a family, and because that's part of our routine and who we like to interact with, are there supports there that we would like to have for our provider or be able to think through and strategize together um, how we can make those situations easier or more fun or build language into those together? So moving away from um, using the same routine over and over again, such as playtime generally, to continue su successful strategies. So moving beyond play, but looking at maybe when we're playing outdoors with a sibling or when we go to the park or when my child um, gets dropped off at school um, and opportunities like that where we can build upon those small successes and start to generalize on a larger scale. So we can really ensure, and you as a parent feel confident that yes, we've mastered this. We got through that challenge and I can see it across different settings now, right? We've built upon this one place we started and now it's, it's reached out or it's branched out. So knowing this information, how do we maximize um, our early intervention visits or services? And these are four um, broad ways, and we'll talk about things that are a little bit more specific. But as a parent or caregiver, some of the ways you can maximize your services is during a visit, 
um, using modeling to as a way to help demonstrate or explain a specific strategy that maybe your provider has in mind or that maybe you had in mind and an idea that you guys came up with is to practice it together, right? Just like when you're coaching and you're going to through um, baseball practice, it's that modeling, it's that demonstration on how you hit the ball, how you catch the ball and things like that, that give you that visual reassurance um, of what's happening. And if I understand as a parent key, what am I gonna do? How am I gonna do it? And does it work for me? Which leads into a practice, right? Trying it out together to work out the kinks as best you can, because you're in that moment and in that routine where you can um, practice it and try it, okay? Or you could also think of new times where you can carry over that that strategy that you came up together. During your early intervention visits, you always wanna provide time or have some time at the very end, if, if at least, to review and discuss the strategies you came up, kind of reflect upon the feedback you got from each other and decide and plan for what you'll do next. Right, so you've had that opportunity to work with your occupational therapist, your teacher, or your PT, and you came up with a nice set of strategies that you plan to use. But thinking through now, once Brian leaves, what am I going to do? How am I going to do it? Do I really understand what my role is and what I'll do between the next time I see my PSP? So it's thinking through those pieces and ensuring that right, you, you feel confident on it or answering, having your provider answer any last minute questions that you have. And then part of that plan is also thinking ahead of how much time do I think as a parent, I'll need to practice and implement this, right? Is it something I'm gonna do right away? Um, how often because of my other kids, right? That I need to take care of, that we're working and we have a lot of things on our plate. So thinking through that piece of how much practice you'll need and how much time before you'd like to meet with your provider again to either check in on how that's going or you may have another question or concern that you'd like support around. So all of these things are built into using that PSP approach and that coaching style um, in your early intervention services. So where do you go from here? Some of the things that may um, occur is that it's really important to share what's important right now for you, right? What are the things that are going well? Sharing with your provider the struggles that you have and what you'd like to see happen. For example, as a parent, my biggest struggle as my um, twins got older was potty training. That was the biggest hurdle I remember thinking about from the day they were born is, oh my God, how am I going to do this with two kids at the same time before they go to preschool, right? And we know that that stress and when my coach or my provider worked with me, it was really thinking through what's important right now, what I'd like to see happen and asking those questions and openly communicating about what's worked in the past, what didn't, because it wasn't my first rodeo, right? I didn't realize that until she asked me about, hey, don't you have an older kid? I'm like, yes. How old is she? Oh, she's 14. Well, you potty trained her, right? Uh-huh. So what worked for you then, right? What do you remember that process? And I remembered it vaguely. And how would that work now, right? Sharing that ideas together to see, are there things I can pull from that that will now match my younger kids versus what I did with my older kid? And ultimately, at the end of that, that coaching or that reflective process with her, she said, really, I, she didn't share any new ideas with me. It was really me who came up with my ideas, but she really helped me process through those and think through how I would do it. Um, what were the times? When was my start time? Did I have a deadline I wanted to get it done? And we worked through that. And lo and behold, I had a plan and I could implement it. 
And I did because I was down to that wire. I had to do it in the next like three weeks and be done with it. So, and that helped me over that hurdle of uncertainty. So it's that participation, that third item there is engaging and sharing your ideas with your provider. So it gives them an idea on what to build upon and they can um, talk through with you and try and give strategies or think about things that maybe you never came up with together to see if they would work. And that plan of continuing them after the visit. Was that activity and routine absolutely part of what was important to me? Yes, right? It might not have been an interest activity, but it was a routine I know I needed to do. It was something that ultimately was important, but I avoided because I didn't know what to do or how to do it. So it really helped me over that hurdle. So the times where you would like support for from your provider should include activities and routines that maybe you'd like support on um, and schedule those visits when they occur as best as possible. Okay. It could also be um, routines and activities that you would love to have your child participate in, but there was a challenge in getting there, right? There was a reason why you weren't doing it or you weren't participating in the activity. And you maybe want some feedback from your, your early interventionist to say, how can I include my child in that social group when my child doesn't know how to talk? I would really love for him to be in that play group, but he has no words. So how do I do that, right? That can be an activity that you could get support around as to how do we in, incorporate that or how do we um, have your child become part of that um, activity that is important to you. And the final one at the bottom is looking at your learning style. We know like kids, all of us as adults all have different learning styles as well. So thinking about how you learn best right? What is your learning style? Are you a visual learner? Like, do you love to watch a video clip as an example of a demonstration? Or do you like writing things down? Some families or parents love hands-on, right? They want to try it and be in the moment and practice it. Um, is it helpful to have a checklist of writing down that strategy and putting it up somewhere that you always remember? Um, I remember putting things in my calendar because that's where I, that's what I pull up every single day. So that's where I would put down my strategies of what I'm going to do today or by the end of the week. Um, so think about how you learn best and share that with your provider so that they can really start to match um, services to that learning style, right? What I've seen with some of our providers, especially when they use telepractice, is they can build in some of those visual pieces with some sample videos or some clips to give examples, or they can send links now, right? And look through um, documents together to see if that's an idea that really fits um, your needs. So even with the, the craziness that COVID has brought us, it has also taught us to look at different learning styles and different opportunities to connect with families. We've learned to use things like technology um, better than we ever have. Our hesitation was huge in the beginning and COVID kind of forced that hand, right? It really forced us to think outside the box, to do something different and to do the best in those Zoom experiences as much as possible because we couldn't be there in the home. Um, we couldn't be hands-on with your child. We really had to have you as the parent be there to dialogue with us, to try something out, to give us feedback. So those opportunities have um, opened up a whole new door for us and a whole new world in how we provide services. Um, has it still been challenging? I think absolutely, right? It comes with its own set of challenges as well but I think it's broadened the um, variety of how we can reach families and caregivers in different ways. So I'd like to take some um, time to take any questions or comments. So 
So Brian and Dr. Chen, did we have any? Yeah, thank you so much for your wonderful presentation, Cherry. That was very helpful and informative. So we have a few questions from our audience. Sure. Before I get to the questions, I just want to remind everyone that I'll be announcing the um, winners, uh, participating winners at the end of the workshop. So please stay tuned. So some questions that we have is, um, how often would, um, um, would I typically see a service provider? In terms of the frequency of visits, it really is dependent upon um, how much support you as a parent would need that feedback from your provider. So it could be in the beginning more frequent, maybe a week or two apart because you're gonna start implementing something very quickly and you do really want that feedback um, right away from that provider, right? But thinking about how often am I going to try and practice before I need to have my provider come back, right? Is it a week? Is it two weeks? Um, is it a month? Because I know in my schedule in the next month, we're going on a trip. I have this other stuff for my other kids. I'm a working mom, right? And if I'm going to practice this only on the weekends, how much practice would I need before I have something to share back with my provider? And that's something your provider can work through with you too, to think about in planning for um, how frequent or when you should plan your next visit. So if you were in our program um, a few years back, uh, services may look like more like, oh, we see you every month, or we see you every two weeks, just you know, routinely, but we're really moving away from that uh, rigidity to be more open and flexible, right? Maybe right now you feel like I'm so in survival mode and I really need a lot of help. So your visits might be uh, much closer together, but as you build those strategies and you try things out and things start working, then the frequency might start to get further and further apart because I'm like, oh, I've learned so much from Dr. Chan and I've implemented and I'm in a much better place. I think I'm on a better role now. So maybe I don't need to see you in two weeks. Maybe can we try in another two months because of all this stuff going on in my life, right? So, and that's absolutely okay. But it's having that conversation openly with your provider so everybody knows um, the situation and can um, reflect together. Very good, very helpful. And then there are, um, is there is any challenges you've seen during this pandemic in terms of receiving the service? Um, I think definitely during the pandemic, some of the shifts we had to do early on was that shift from in totally in-person, right? Our services were always in the natural setting. So it was always within the family or caregiver's home or school or daycare provider. Um, and we had to switch totally to telepractice or through Zoom because of the COVID and the safety measures. So that was a huge hurdle and challenge. What we're seeing now is that sort of that shift back to a more blended model where we are starting, we have started doing in-person or in-home services again, but there are families that have chosen a blended of some in-home and some telepractice or via Zoom. So it's a mixture um, and what that looks like because we do have to still be very aware of the safety precautions, the social distancing, the mask wearing. So our program providers have a very specific um, guideline that they need to follow and ensure that the families understand that to not only keep um, your family and your child safe in your home, but for our providers as well, right? Who see many children over the course of a week or through a day is we wanna keep everybody safe and healthy. So those precautions that are similar to what you see in workplaces or in um, different businesses also apply to early intervention in a different way, right? We talk about how many people are in your home? Is it well ventilated? Is there an outdoor space that we can use? So we're, we're also be trying to be very creative um, in doing that. But have we shifted back to in-home? We have. I think our programs have started shifting in different um, degrees, right? 
I think some have moved along very quickly back to in-home and families were like, yes, they can come back to my home. And others are still very, very cautious, right? About if your child has a lot of medical fragile or you have medical diagnosis and have low immune system, right? Those are factors that play into that. Very good. The next question is really interesting. Um, what do I do if I get stuck with a problem during the week or on the weekend? Is there any way that you can reach out to your um, provider? Absolutely, right? At any point in time that you feel stuck that, oh, that strategy that Brian showed me, it's not quite working and I want to, I feel like that urgency to call, definitely think about what your mode of communication will be right? Is your provider available via phone or via email during the evenings or over the weekends, right? What is that communication going to look like? Um, or to know, right, if it is a Saturday and it's that provider's weekend to that time frame of when they'll be able to communicate back to you. I think it varies which it, with each provider and what they're available to do, but definitely thinking about that and knowing, um, talking to your provider about what that would look like, right? If I do get stuck, you know, when are times can I can call you or email you and things like that and what would work? Okay, the next question is um, more geared toward the supporting group, I think. Um, they ask, are there any ways to meet other parents or receive parent-to-parent -parent support while um, the child is in their early intervention? Um, we don't have like a formal support group, so to say, in early intervention, but if you do, if you are interested in connecting with another parent um, and for support, I would definitely connect back with your care coordinator or let your primary service provider know that you have that interest and they can look to see if there's other parents in their program that are open to connecting with you. And it could be not just in uh, one particular program that you're a part of, but across other programs, right? So if you are um, on one island, right, would it be helpful to connect with another, say, Maui family? Or are you thinking about something broader, like someone on a family on Oahu, because that's maybe where you plan to move, right? Or where transition will be, and you want to kind of get a feel for or connect with a family that might live in a certain area or have similar needs to mine, right, to start um, building that source of support. So your care coordinator would be your first point of contact or your PSP. Okay, very nice. And then um, the next question is about how, how do you know if your provider is the right fit for your child? Hmm. I think that's a very individual question. I think as a parent, um, you know your child the best and you know what your needs are the best, right? What your learning style is. And part of the early intervention process in selecting the primary service provider is that the teams do go through a discussion to look at what are the needs um, that you've brought up to the team, right? What are your priorities and concerns and what are the routines and activities that um, you may need support around and then looking at your child's needs and where the services might take place, whether that's in the home or community. And we look to see um, of our providers who has the knowledge and expertise to address your priorities and concerns. Um, they bring together information that they've learned um, through appointments with you, such as your intake appointment, the evaluation, your eligibility meeting with your care coordinator, as well as your FDA or your family directed assessment. So all that rich information that you've shared from um, point A till IFSP, if your child is eligible for services, is they're really pulling together that information. So if there's times where you feel like, you know, I think I really feel more comfortable if it was um, a person with a certain type of background or a certain type of knowledge expertise, I think that's very important to share with your care coordinator. Or maybe you've had a past um, working relationship because maybe your 
older child used to be in early intervention and you had a great relationship with the teacher that was there. That could be somebody that might be put higher up on that um, fit for you, or maybe it's not, it wasn't a good fit. So that's something we need to know that that wasn't such a great fit. So we want to be aware of that when we're making our um, selection process. But ultimately, the selection of who your PSP is happens at your child's IFSP meeting. So we have some discussion as preparation, but at your IFSP, once your outcomes are developed based on your child's needs and all the information we've gathered, then we look at the services, and that includes identifying that PSP. So taking that opportunity to share your thoughts um, and share your feelings about your comfort level and who may be a great fit, or maybe asking your team about maybe why they might have selected person A versus person B, and are you okay with that, right? So it's having that open dialogue together because if as a provider, I may not have touched on the pieces that are priority, priority to you, I would really want to know that, right? It makes a big difference when a family can, can voice their, um, their needs and things that will make that process smoother and more positive for them. I think that holds a great, a tremendous amount of weight. And that helps your team figure out what that best fit in because it's not always gonna be a perfect fit, but we're trying to look at all the different pieces together to come up with that best fit. All right, very Thank you for good. That. Could you briefly just describe a little bit about the IFSP for those that aren't familiar with that acronym? Okay, the IFSP is your individualized family support plan. So similar to if like an IEP at the end, once you've gathered information, we've had an evaluation and your child has been determined eligible, we put together an individualized family support plan that paints that picture of all the information we've gathered and then based on that, what are the needs and what are the outcomes or goals that we have in mind that we'd like to see happen in the next few months to a year, for instance. It depends on when your child comes into the system. But over time, right, what are those outcomes that we'd like to see happen? And then who can support um, getting us there? So your services that will support those outcomes. And in that IFSP, you develop your outcomes, you determine um, who will be part of your service team, including your primary service provider, your care coordinator, and any um, consultants that you may need to have um, joint visits with or support from. Okay? And in that, we talk about your family's rights, um, provision of services, um, and when that next check-in would be. So that's part of that process as well, when that IFSP is reviewed. Okay, and that's your consent for services. So once that plan is put into place and you've signed that, then that starts, um, that enables us to start services. Okay, so I have a question if parents or teachers feel like this um, child um, may benefit from their services? Um, can they self-refer or they need to go through the pediatricians or the um, physician um, to refer to the, the program? For early intervention, referrals can come from pretty much any source. So whether you're a teacher, the child's teacher, preschool teacher, daycare provider, pediatrician or specialist, maybe the child um, was previously in the NICU, or may have come from another state, anyone can make that initial referral to early intervention. Our referral line will confirm the referral with the parent to move forward. But the referral source on who calls can be anyone. What we like to be able to do is if it hasn't come from the medical home or the pediatrician that at some point in the intake process, we, we pull that piece in because we always wanna make sure we're collaborating with that child's um, pediatrician or medical home. Okay, but great. we have a lot of self-referrals. I was one, right? 
even working in early intervention, we go, hmm, is my child on track? <laughs> so um, it can come from any source. Can you give, um, can you give us um, approximate timeline um, after someone referred to the program? How long should they expect to get, you know, to hear back from the program? From the point of initial referral or that call in, that referral gets um, processed within the first 24 hours and then um, assigned or sent to the program in your, your family's geographic area. Because we're a state, we provide services statewide. Um, majority of our referrals for Oahu come in through our early intervention referral line. And then once it's been confirmed, it goes out to the assigned program for that area. For instance, if you're in Mililani, that would get assigned to the program that covers that area. Um, we don't have just one central program anymore. We have several programs, I think about eight or so that cover Oahu, and then programs that cover each of the neighbor islands. For our neighbor islands, it's usually a direct referral to that program. For instance, on Maui, it's Imua Family Services. On the Big Island, it could be Hilo Easter Seals or our Kona North Hawaii program. Um, but they, they typically get referrals straight to them, but it's that same turnaround time of 24 hours for that initial contact. From there, you would get connected with your um, care coordinator to start the intake process. But the timeline to when, say, you start services, um, federally, our timeline would be 45 days. So to, from initial referral to signing that IFSP is 45 days. So it's a very quick process and there's a lot of meetings and appointments that happen in that short time frame. Um, and it's because we have such a sh short time frame with your kid, child, right? From birth to three, it goes very, very quickly and kids change so quickly. So we wanna get in there as soon as possible. So if they change their mind, um, initially, if they didn't feel like they're interested in receiving the services and then, you know, um, next few months, they feel like maybe the child can be benefits for the services, can they reach out to you or um, what process Absolutely. they need to do? Absolutely. Yes. It's not a one time only. If you feel right now is not the great time and you want to kind of do like a re-referral later or restart the process later, yes, you can do that. You can do that, absolutely. So you can decline a service at any point in time. And if you do, as long as your child is before the age of three to resume, um, you can connect back with your program or do a new referral. From there, they'll guide you as to what steps you need to do in order to resume services. So it depends of where you are in that process, but absolutely you can re-refer or come back into the program. Okay, now I have the last question and then we will announce the participating um, winners. So the last question is, why do some children get rejected from receiving special education when they turn three? When they turn three? Okay, so I, I can't really say why they get rejected if it's at age three, other than our services end at age three. So if you're coming into our program at age three, we would need to refer to our next, I guess, program, which would be Department of Education, special education programs to see if your child is eligible. But if it's before age three and say you made the referral and we went through the evaluation, there could be, there are kids that um, do not meet our eligibility criteria for early intervention services. So we do have an eligibility criteria based on the evaluation tool that we use. Um, so if you don't meet that criteria, you would not be eligible for services. However, even with that said, could you still get some strategies and support and, and some ideas? Because basically what they're saying is your child is on track. Right, your child is developing at the rate or at the level that they should be for their age, but they can absolutely still share with you some ideas on how to keep that going. Right, what are some activities, what are some strategies you can continue to implement as a family. And if you still have concerns right to either call back or check in with your pediatrician to keep monitoring right because I think as a parent sometimes you just never know when things change and you want to know like at what point 
do I check in and who would that be with? So we do, we do have an eligibility criteria. Thank you so much, Cherry. That was wonderful and a lot of information. And, you know, Brian posted uh, a couple of links there. You can get more information by going through early inter intervention website.